So we are now at our final speaker of the day who really doesn't need an introduction, but he is going to get one anyway. And that is Kim Eckert. Anyone who has ever birded in Minnesota for even a small amount of time has heard of Kim Eckert. He is our Dean of Birding in the state. His interest in birding was sparked in the Chicago area during a 10th grade biology class, the only biology class he would ever take. He became an English major at St. John's University in Minnesota and then taught English with some first year French on the side during the 1970s. But he turned to a career in birding after moving to Duluth in 1977 where he served as a naturalist at Hawk Ridge Nature Reserve for a total of 20 years, taught bird identification classes for a decade, and started leading birding tours, including 30 years with Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. In 1986, he created the Minnesota Birding Weekends and Weeks program of tours throughout Minnesota and elsewhere in the US and Canada, which is now starting its 38th season. And if you have never been on one of those trips, you really, really need to go. They are amazing and the best birding deal out there. Um, he has written numerous articles for The Loon and other publications, plus a book called Birding by Hindsight, which is a compilation of The Loon's series of 70 bird ID articles and four previous editions of A Birder's Guide to Minnesota. After 45 years, he still lives in Duluth where he muses about the Great Plains, prefers not to take anything too seriously and finds joy in not knowing where he is going. Let's welcome Kim Eckert. Thank you, Susan. Am I audible? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are. You're audible and we can see you too. All right. How's the screen look? Uh, not shared yet. <laughs> oh, screen sharing, right? <clears throat> Correct. There I am. All right. On his way. Yep, looking good. All you have to do is uh, put it in the play mode and expand it. Looking good, Kim. Okay. Perfect. The um, is it okay? I'm seeing extraneous stuff on the sides, but I guess you can't see that. I'm uh, sorry to hear you guys about um, all your problems. Uh, I'm a, I'm available to come on down and help you out if you want. Please we, do. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but we haven't. We didn't get any of that. However, um, I don't feel. Um, too sorry for you. We're only seven inches shy in Duluth of our all-time record of 135 inches. Uh, we're at 128 right now. So my shovel has been getting uh, lots of use. Um, okay. Um, Birder's Guide to Minnesota is the book. I'm going to sort of talk about it, but sort of not. Um, this has had alternate titles uh, people used to ask me well where do i go to find such and such and the other th or whatever and uh, in previous editions i would just say or someone would say well it's in the damn book um dorothy the gr late great dorothy brindle who was taking my trips until she was 90 uh she uh called it something else that we won't uh use that term in polite company um I don't know how much I'm going to talk about bird finding. I mean, after all, there's 1,400 sites in the book, and how am I going to get to all of them? I'm not. Um, but I do want to leave you with some thoughts. I, I'm going to talk more about what I learned or what I relearned or what I was reminded of while doing this book, and maybe that will spark some uh, thoughts from, from the audience as well. But I want to leave you with uh, once going to a bird tour, leading a bird tour in Texas, my horoscope on the in-flight magazine said, embrace the joy of not knowing where you were going. That was helpful advice. And uh, one of my favorite books of all time back when I was in college, Rabbit Run, my favorite passage was when Rabbit says, 
or not rabbit, but the person he's talking to says, the only way to get somewhere, you know, is to figure out where you're going before you go there. And rabbit says, I don't think so. Those are kind of things that I, that, that are always on my mind. Well, like I say, there are um, 1,400 sites in the book. Um, I, I tried to get through all of them, but no, no way. So um, I used to do these programs I've done before for the MOU top 10 this or top 10 that or the other thing. I'm only going to have two of the top 10 topics that I had prepared today. I got started doing it. I think like Ben and some of the others and only got partway through. So I'm only going to do two chapters of what I originally uh, thought I'd talk about. Um, so we can call this the top two of the top 10 of the top 1400 in a way. Um, let's start with... Um, how big the state is, I guess. Uh, I think St. Louis County might as well be a state in its own, but let's start up in, in uh, Kitson County, way up in the Northwest, and you can see how far away that is. And um, that if you, were, uh, if you were up in Kitson County, you can see you'd be closer to, um, uh, where, Oh, there I am, Flin Flon, if you've ever been there, <laughs> or Saskatoon, then you are to, to Houston County. Or my favorite statistic is um, when you're up in Grand Portage, up in Cook County, you're about as close as you are to Hudson Bay, way up in Canada. Um, anyway, so if you're up in, in Kitsum County um, and you're standing in downtown Noise, which has a railroad building and some abandoned customs buildings. And you're pro what you're probably doing is wondering why you're there. But another question is, are you still in Minnesota? You're 500 miles farther. Uh, if you want to go back down to the other corner of Minnesota, yeah, it's a drive of 500 miles, according to Google Maps. And it takes you through... Um, through the flicker tail state to get there. Of course, you all know what the flicker tail flicker tail state is. Name for a mammal. A um, lot of variety in Minnesota. You've got uh, 2,300 foot Eagle Mountain in Cook County, and it's only 13 miles away from the lowest spot in Minnesota. A lot of people don't know that's Lake Superior, 600 feet. Let's talk about shorebirds a little bit. You heard about Ben uh, talk earlier about uh, sewage ponds. There's a lot of other things about that you can get there other than shorebirds. In fact, most don't have shorebirds. The, the water levels are too high or they're heavily rip-wrapped with rocks. So there isn't that much mud left. So unless Ben can identify this thing, um, whatever kind of shorebird that is, um, it's actually a better place for ducks and, and swallows and things like that, but there's still a, there's still a resource. And it's one of my favorites, there's only, there's only, uh, 403 of them in Minnesota at my count. The oldest one, anyone know? Albany up in Stearns County, 1955 was the first. Uh, <laughs> do you bird there? Uh, yeah, sometimes you can. There's Sleepy Eye uh, in Brown County. They're, they've always been welcoming birders. A lot of you know Brian Smith. Uh, he keeps track of what's there. On the other hand, there's places, I'm not going to name the town. You can figure that out after you get arrested. But a couple of birders a few years ago were just standing on the berm inside the open gate, just a few feet from the open gate, and um, got a ticket for uh, trespassing. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, while some most people like me like birded sewage ponds, uh, some people prefer more remote areas like Forest Service, uh, like uh, uh, national, state, county forests. Um, and um, 
it's easy to get lost there, which I really sometimes enjoy doing. Sometimes you best find the best birds and the best experiences when you're lost. And you go to a go to a state or national forest. It's a good place to do that. Um, but remember, uh, I shouldn't say remember, but probably a lot of you don't realize that national forests are uh, under the Department of Agriculture. And what do they do with Department of Agriculture is grow things so they can harvest them. Um, so I don't know. Uh, are trees in the Department of, uh, Department of Agriculture, I guess they think they're about the same thing as corn, soybeans, sugar beets, trees. Uh, one thing to do is you bird wherever you're going to bird and haven't been very helpful on that yet, uh, listing the 1,400 sites, is there's something I call the straight versus uh, crooked road theory of uh, navigation. So if you're, at, if, you're, if you're looking at a map, and this is an old county map with some, with some notes uh, in the corner that I've, that I don't know where they date from, but you can see down in the lower part of the map, you see how relatively straight the roads are. So if you're looking at a map and all the roads are straight, what does that mean? It's usually farmland. And what do you want to look for if you're down in southeastern or southwestern Minnesota? Look for the crooked roads. Those are the ones that are going to have the, um, you know, where the woods are. If you're looking for a wood lot to find some migrant warblers out in farm country, or in this case, like at at uh, at, uh, at um, Lake City uh, along the Mississippi, in the in the northeast in the boreal forest, it's a little bit different. Straight roads. If you're going to have a bog and you want a road, you just go straight through. Curvy roads. You look at a map. Curvy roads, winding roads. They're the ones that go around through more, you know, past lakes and deciduous woods. It's nice country, but I'd rather go straight through a spruce bog. Um, <clears throat> but no matter how good or bad you are re at reading maps, my advice sometimes is to uh, sometimes not look at maps, not look at this book, for example. I suppose that's curious advice. But take the time once in a while to put this book and the maps aside. Turn down that obscure side road that leads off the edge of a map into the unknown and trust in serendipity to find you something. That's not very good advice, I guess, from someone trying to sell a bird finding guide. All I had time for, uh, my book is divided into three regions, the west, southeast, and northeast, kind of matching three biomes in Minnesota. Um, but um, I'm only going to have time to do the West region and one other section. Uh, there just isn't any time to do the whole thing. So I have to limit it to the West region, uh, starting up in, um, in Northwestern Minnesota. The, the problem is three of the best areas are gone. Uh, they used to, for years, birders used to be able to go to Agassiz, National Wildlife Refuge, they'd give you a gate key, off you go, return the gate, the key, and you're all set. They don't do that anymore. They kind of stopped granting access when they had new a new ref, refuge manager since the good old days. We've lost birding areas. We've, we've basically lost, there's still great birds at Agassiz, still great places to bird there, but it's the best places, sorry, Crookston sewage ponds, just last year, they stopped uh, offering access. A lot of sewage ponds, like Sleepy Eye, they invite you in, not so Crookston. Uh, they used to, for many years, it's a great, one of the best set of sewage ponds, or at least used to be in the state. But, um, and the, the city uh, management, the, the, the uh, public works, they, you just contact them, they gave you a key. Really nice people there. Pipestone, another place. Sleepy Eye, there's several like that, but not so much Crookston anymore. And even the local um, professor there, biology professor who's been there for a long time at uh, 
uh, at U of M Crookston. He can't bring his biology classes there anymore, which seems odd. So I don't know what the big deal is about sewage ponds. Go to go to some of these other states like like Arizona. They have great wastewater treatment areas that, that now they invite you in. Not so in Minnesota. There's another great place, uh, an Audubon sanctuary formerly. Used to be a great place. They had a change of management. Um, they, um, you can't bird there anymore. They say that there's an Audubon center there, but there really isn't anything except a, a, a rain garden. And even there, that's not the best part of what used to be wetlands, pines, and prairie. So we've been losing places for sure. Northwestern Minnesota, uh, uh, that's the area where you get Glacial Lake Agassiz. That is uh, the beach line of Glacial Lake Agassiz. A lot of prairie up there in that strip uh, that's kind of visible from uh, starting up around Thief River Falls. And its last birding area is down in uh, is down in Travers County. But uh, one place that's really great is Glacial Ridge National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the uh, there are national wildlife refuges go. This is a map of Glacial Ridge you can see. But there's, <laughs> I used to think a national wildlife refuge meant, meant, oh, something really good, a place to go that you won't find anything anywhere else. Well, right near Glacial Ridge Refuge is Rydell Refuge. And I assume some of you have been there and maybe have a different opinion, but I've never seen anything there that I haven't seen elsewhere. And, um, I used to think, I used to think that uh, that to be a national wild, wildlife wildlife refuge, uh, it should have something different uh, that you, that you can't find farther down the road or around the corner. But Rydell is pretty much looks the same as everything else. And uh, there's another place in northeastern Minnesota I'm not going to get to. Crane Meadows is another national wildlife refuge. Um, that um, <laughs> there's nothing different about it. I don't know why they call it a refuge, but there it is. Um, anyway, those are kind of disillusioning. But in the same area is the town of Mentor, also is the town of Erskine. And I was birding up there once with my friend, Don Keenholz, looked at a map and he said, you know, Without a good mentor, Erskine can get in a lot of trouble. Keep that in mind. Wabin Marsh is an ornithological historical monument. Uh, since the 1950s, when uh, Yellow Rails and Nelson Sparrows were found there, not so much anymore. The habitat has changed. Uh, in fact, if you're looking for Yellow Rails or Nelson Sparrows, good luck. The, they're so dependent on water levels. The most famous place for yellow rail still is McGregor Marsh in Aiken County. Again, I'm not going to get to that part of the state today, but uh, um, the rails, are, I'm total, told, are still there. You can still hear them at night, but the Nelson sparrows are gone. That's another puzzling bird. Where are, where are the Nelson sparrows? You get them in migration, but where do they nest? Probably the biggest tragedy in North, in all of Minnesota ornithology is the loss of Lapland, of, I'm sorry, chestnut called long spurs. They pretty much petered out. Let's hope the, the trend is reversed, uh, but it's one of those prairie grassland birds. It's the most colorful one. It's always been my favorite prairie bird. They're gone from Felton. They just don't nest there anymore. There's hardly any... I don't know, the last three, four years, I think there's only been one or two isolated sightings. But of course, what Minnesota is really about, most Minnesotans that they would consider the three necessities of life, at least uh, if you're down there in the Twin Cities and heading for your weekend cabin in the woods or walleye fishing or your white-tailed deer stand in the fall, uh, they're not so much into birds as as uh, what most Minnesotans are. But Western, this is this is a quote from Becker County. 
uh, Detroit Lakes. And the western part of that county does have some nice looking prairie. But of course, if you're going to be a true Minnesotan, you better get back to eastern. You better get back to eastern um, part of the county. Um, you're back to your cabin on the lake and because your lawn needs mowing. Those walleyes aren't going to catch themselves and the deer stand just fell out of the tree. Fergus Falls, uh, Ottertail County, uh, one of my favorite towns. I used to fantasize that it was, that instead of Fergus Falls, I just call it Ferg. Uh, Steve Millard taught me that. He's the dean of uh, Ottertail County Birders. He taught me to just call it Ferg. I used to hope that they they called it Frostbite Falls. That was the inspiration for the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Now, that was television worth watching. And I always remember fondly that show when I was, uh, when I'm birding up in Ferg. Fergus Falls also has Grotto Lake. They've got a giant otter there you can look at. And they do have a few black crowned night herons in a, in a small rookery there. Uh, maybe four, five, six pairs. The largest, as far as I know, it's the largest black crown night heron nesting colony in the state. How many black crown night heron colonies are there in Minnesota? Who knows? How many are there? We don't know. Why not? Minnesota has a pretty poor track record uh, over the years of keeping track of, clo of colonial nesting water birds. And in my view, black crown night heron, I hope maybe some of you out there can can help me out here. Where do black crown night herons, where do they consistently nest? Pig's Eye Lake? I don't know. I don't think so. But um, anyway, <laughs> the nearest colony might be up in Ferd, and there's only a few pairs there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about county listing. You can't talk about Minnesota without talking about listers. And uh, one of the best places in uh, Western Minnesota, one of the best was mentioned earlier is that uh, North Ottawa flood control impoundment. Unfortunately, it's right on the Grant County line, Tra Traverse County line, but it's all in Grant County. So what do you do if you're a Traverse County lister? Well, there's some advice for you that um, I guess we don't have time for. There's an aerial view uh, of, the, of the impoundment. It looks different almost every time you go there, depending on the season. Now would be the time to go. Another favorite place is where I actually taught English and taught uh, French, uh, beginning French. I taught B team, ba I was the coach of B team basketball. I kind of remember those days. It kind of reminds me of Ted Lasso, not knowing what the heck he's doing. But um, and uh, there, of course, is the giant flying coot. You look at, I mean, it's really a cool statue. They've got lobed toes and all. But anyway, I'll take you a tour up there. And I'd show you my old classroom where I used to te teach English and French. This is going back to the 1971 to 1973. But that part of the school, that classroom is no longer there. Minnesota River Valley. Mostly the part out in western Minnesota, always been fascinating. You gotta, it's a lot of it is inaccessible, but man, you got a you got a, a combination of hillsides, of junipers, of uh, deciduous riparian forest. You got pastures. You got flooded. The the river floods every year for shorebirds. It's really a it's really a wonderful place to explore. It goes all the way from uh, the South Dakota border, uh, you know, into the Twin Cities, but it's the part. It starts getting more wooded and uh, less, fewer pastures and fewer uh, junipers as you get down towards Mankato, and then its character kind of starts changing. All of you have heard of Salt Lake. Um, it was mentioned earlier, Michelle mentioned earlier about the festival coming up. Um, that's uh, uh, that's a, a, another ornithological historical monument. Um, 
And, you know, that festival, you should try it sometimes. Get out there, uh, make sure your Sons of Norway membership is um, current so you get the best portions at the Days End dinner. Um, and um, Madison is also happens to be the Ludafisk capital of the United States. Uh, if you don't know what Ludafisk is, or never tasted it, uh, you're not missing anything. Um, it's kind of second to walleye in Minnesota in, in its uh, popularity. Um, <laughs> no, where else do you work in Western? There's a lot of people clean garbage, garbage dumps. Yeah, I was gonna say um, gravel pits. Oh yeah, you go to Gravel Pit here, there, anywhere, especially in the southwestern quarter of the state, and you'll find blue grosbeaks. And uh, you know why? Can anybody tell me why? I've, I've asked people why do blue grosbeaks like gravel pits. No one can tell me, and maybe they don't. If you look at eBird records, you'll find that most gravel pits. You go to look up, look up uh, blue grosbeak and eBird. At the, that have been reported gravel pit habitats, whatever habitat that happens to be. Um, you know, how do you describe the habitat? You know, heavily disturbed with dust and noisy gravel trucks, I guess. Um, most of them, the birds are not there the following year. That's the exception. If you find a gravel pit that a pair of blue grosbeaks returns in following years, that's the exception. Um, another area, it's the, it's the, uh, the Coteau de, de Prairie, it's the, um, it's the dividing the drainage, that dividing line between the Minnesota Mississippi River watershed and the Missouri River watershed. And um, that's really fascinating, really nice area of, of prairie hillsides. I think you can tell I've always been, I always liked Western Minnesota, the prairies, et cetera. Um, one of the best example, the good example, maybe Yellow Medicine County, Western Yellow Medicine County, great place. Uh, but Lincoln County, also down around Lake Benton, is some some just really beautiful country. It all you can also find some good uh, Coteau per, uh, habitat in uh, in the eastern in eastern uh, Pipestone and western southwestern Murray, kind of before it peters out. Um, but it's also a great place to find windmills. Of course, wind power is better than other sources of, of electricity, but they can sure clutter up the, the scenery. Uh, this is a photo of your recording secretary. That's Catherine up there on the hillside, walking around the Prairie Hotel. And I kind of, I, I don't know if she's looking for windmills or what, but probably birds and I really like that country down there, the Coteau. Um, your Uncle Paul's mother's garden, uh, you know, don't ask. The, the term goes way back to the 1960s. He's got the highest yard. It's a fairly, uh, he doesn't live there anymore. His mother passed away. But when he lit, did live there back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, he had, he had really, it was one of the best birding places. You can find birds anywhere. Your own yard has, you know, you don't have to buy this book and, uh, you know, go to all these places. You can find good birds almost anywhere. Paul had a little nice yard, big yard, 235 species. As far as I know, that's his yard list. He keeps track once, he still gets back to Cottonwood once in a while. And we're talking about Cottonwood in Lyon County. We're not talking about Cottonwood County. And that's one of the things that'll get you lost is, um, for example, you probably you may have heard that uh, Cottonwood was a great place to go birding. You have good sewage ponds, Sham Lake, Cottonwood Lake. Um, right nearby is Gabriel Lake. You call it you call it uh, Lone Tree Lake, but that's a misnomer. Um, Paul taught, taught me way back in the 60s. And, no, that's Gabriel Lake. 
and how it got changed to Lone Tree Lake, I don't know. It's it's Gabriel. But that's right outside of Cottonwood. You want to go to Cottonwood? Oh, let's go. Uh, but the common rookie mistake is you end up in uh, where? Wyndham or somewhere else in Cottonwood County. It's not the same as Cottonwood, Minnesota in Lyon County. Uh, Pipestone is um, one of these places. It's got prairie coteaux, great sewage ponds, another set of sewage ponds with permission. They're glad to give you permission to do that. Um, but what it doesn't have is lakes. It's uh, one of the few, four counties, there's only four counties, Minnesota DNR has, says has no natural lakes. Rock is another one next door, no natural lakes. Mauer is another. The other one is Olmstead, the four counties without any lake, natural lakes. Olmstead also has the dubious distinction of no sewage ponds and no lakes, both. But it's a, it's not a bad county, but we're not gonna get to it today. That's in the Southeast uh, region. Pipestone is also up in this coteau. It's higher ground. You know, if you're gonna be the dividing line between watersheds, you gotta be up a little bit higher. And even though Eagle Mountain and Cook County is the highest spot, the highest town, I'll give you the answer to the quiz, is Holland, Minnesota just northeast of the town of Pipestone. Uh, that's the, the highest town in Minnesota. Um, my favorite will always be Blue Mounds, a place when I started going there in the 1970s. People didn't go there much. I mean, and it was kind of a discovery. Um, I didn't necessarily put it on the map, but Boy, back in those days, the 70s and 80s and maybe even the 90s, um, you know, there are places you could still discover. And I hope your your own Blue Mounds might be, um, you know, uh, my, that was my discovery was Blue Mounds. And, uh, you know, put aside the books. You know, why is the author of a bird finding guide telling you not to use his bird finding guide? Find your own birds without help. Um, Heron Lake is also the, um, also, uh, an interesting place down there in Jackson County and, um, also, uh, it, you probably don't know this, but I had to look it up. Heron Lake is named for what Heron? Black Crown Night Heron. Back in the day around 1900, early 1900s. It was reported that 4,000 black crown night herons summered, bred at Heron Lake. How many are now there? It's probably maybe four in the whole state or anywhere. Again, we really don't know. Uh, if, you, if any of you are connected with the DNR, get, get them to work, trying to keep better track of black crown heron, night herons before they become extirpated as a breeding species in Minnesota. Uh, Jen, Susan, my time is up. I've got another uh, section with um, talking about something a little bit different uh, than um, Western Minnesota, some other places to go to other than birding spots. Would you like me to stop here or go overtime? You know, um, we probably should stop here just because we've got some questions for you, Kim. And um, it's just people have schedules this afternoon. I mean, maybe what we can do is schedule something longer because we could listen to you forever. It's 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 very entertaining and very informative. I could go on forever, of course. Um, the, maybe <laughs> next year I could do the I could do the the southeast region or the northeast. Region. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're going to hold you to that. See, you should never say stuff like that in front of me and Jen. <laughs> just, just let me mention one more thing, and that's the inspiration for me back in 1962 is Bob Russell. Uh, if you want to know more about him, go to mbwbirds.com, my website, uh, read the blog, and you find out all about Bob. But just let me leave you with um, the thoughts that... Um, 
my final page of the book, and this will be my my last slide. Um, um, the disclaimer of movies, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. Well, no county listers were harmed. Uh, let me assure you that, or other things. Uh, I don't take things too seriously. I think you, you maybe know that by now. And uh, from one of my favorite movies of all time, going way back, 1960s, Charlie Greenman will remember that too. Uh, if most things aren't funny, Arnie, then the only exactly what they are, they are. I'll leave you with that. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Susan. Awesome. Hey, Kim, a couple things. Um, if, if your trips for this year, your Minnesota birding weeks and weekends aren't entirely already booked, can you just tell us where people here that are listening can find information on where to sign up? <laughs> uh, sign up in the, it, the last few years, the first of January is when I open up registrations uh, for the coming calendar year or not calendar year, but my birding year, my MBW uh, year, we used to be affiliated. We started in the 86 when we were called Minnesota Ornithologist Union Birding Weekends. We're still somewhat affiliated with MOU, changed the name. Our calendar runs March through February. You just kind of have to luck out and be there on the first day. Some fill up the first day for first week. I'm winding down. Uh, you heard me give you references to the 60s and 70s. So I'm not as young as some of these people anymore. Oh, boy, I'm, I'm really impressed with what some of these younger folks can do that are in their teens and 20s. Um, there are still some openings. Go to mbwbirds.com. Um, and I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, I, there is, there has been instances of insider trading uh but um we'd ra i'd rather not talk about that I, I i understand why and then and then there's another question which is um your book your your the most recent edition is if not sold out very close to sold out do you have plans to do any more do another uh publication sparky is, sparky is the one who taught me taught me into this i wasn't planning to do a print edition we printed 2000 and we were way off, uh, and after four months, all 2,000 are almost gone after only four months, um, which is good news and bad news. I didn't make any money on it. It costs more to print. Got to get those state and national forests, cut down more trees, I guess, or something. But it was very expensive to print. Didn't make any money on it. Uh, but we are doing a second printing. We're getting, we're putting that together uh, starting this past week, uh, that took up a lot of my time because we had a deadline with a with the uh, printer. There's going to be some changes, some updates in it already. Even though it's only been out four months, it's already out of date. Um, and uh, the uh, so there is going to be a second printing that'll be available soon. There are about Sparky tells me there's maybe 150 books. They're all distributed by Adventure Keen Publications in Minnesota. Uh, they, we haven't provided them with any more books. Sparky and I are going to sell the last 150 ourselves this spring, I think. Um, but um, how do you get one? I, uh, yeah, good question. Get, get back to me or Sparky and I can help you with that. Awesome. Kim, thank you so much. Um, the presentation was great, as always. And it's good to see your face. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> okay, Susan. Good to I'll see you. I'll turn it back over to Jen. Yeah, so hey, long. Just so everybody knows, this is Ben. Uh, I did put a link in the chat so people know for the MBW Birds website and specifically another sublink to the, the birding weekends in there. There appears to be some copies on Amazon. I don't know if those are just going through Adventure Keen or, or wherever. That's how I got mine. So I did put that link in the chat as well, just so people are aware. Awesome, Ben. Thank you so much.